is my uh is my audio working? Can you hear me? I can't hear you. Let me let me rejoin. Oh, here. Hold on. Oh, can you hear me now? I hope. Let's see, I've got my little green mic going. I can hear you now. Cool. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah, something with Zoom and computer. We we use like uh, Google Meet, so <laughs> not not as good with troubleshooting the Zoom issues. Yeah, no worries. We we'll use the um. Yeah, you can go ahead and share the screen if you like to. If you have anything to present, I do. Yeah, let me get the notes. Let me do that. I need to give it permission yep. to do stuff. All right, I'll be I'll be right back again. <laugh> okay, no worries. Thanks. Hey, I'm out. Hey, Chris. <laughs> Thanks for joining. Oh, you're... Cool. Yeah, I see that up there. All right, um, let's go ahead and get started. Just a reminder every, uh, for everybody, this is recorded and we'll post it up to the YouTube channel eventually. Um, I get credentials figured out and all that fun stuff. Um, so today, um, I want to thank Brian Overstreet from uh, Pinterest for joining. Um, he's going to talk about T-Script kind of language that they developed um, to query a, ver a varying set of uh, backends for metrics over there at Pinterest for observability and uh, hopefully kind of why you all chose to go that route. So... Um, if you have any questions for Brian, uh, feel free to ask during the presentation or uh, however you prefer to run it, Brian. So I'll turn it over to you. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, and thanks, everyone, for uh, having me at this meeting to present at, for, at about T-Script. Um, so uh, the structure for what I'm thinking is I'll go over kind of just a high-level overview of how we do observability at Pinterest. And then I'll get into T-Script. Um, and please, uh, I, I structure this so that it's kind of, um, should be more like free form so that uh, if you have questions, we can just go right into it. Um, so yeah, so let me, let me get started here. So I'm Brian Overstreet. I'm the observability tech lead at Pinterest. Uh, I've been at the company for 12 years, so back um, when it was a small startup, and then we've grown uh, the observability function uh, over those years. Um, so as far as, um, no, no. as far as uh, what we use for observability, we, we use the like kind of the pillar concept mainly because that's how we store the data. So for Mac metrics, we use Goku. So Goku is our own in-memory time series database. Uh, it's based off the open source Barangay project from Facebook. 
Um, that, and that's a project that uses uh, delta of delta compression to store data points. Uh, so it's pretty pretty efficient. Uh, and then we use our own visualization layer on top of that. So you could kind of think of that similar to uh, uh, Grafana and Alert Manager. <clears throat> and we've had that uh, since the beginning uh, of Pinterest. Uh, and then for logs, we're using AWS Open Search for traces. We're also using Open Search, uh, but we have the Zipkin uh, UI uh, on top of that to to view like traces. Uh, for for logs as well, we're using Kibana uh, as part of that. Um, so for today's talk for TScript. Um, it's it's only for time series data. So TScript does not interact right now with these other uh, pillars. So <clears throat> as I mentioned, Statsboard is our front end for visualization and alerting. So one of the design features of Statsboard and the reason that it's been around so long is that the this visualization and alerting layer is decoupled from the underlying data source. So over the years, we've had many different backend data sources, such as Ganglia, Graphite, OpenTSDB, and now Goku. So the idea here is that users shouldn't really have to know too much about the the data storage layer. Um, they just need to be able to visualize and uh, alert on their metrics. So here's an example of kind of what the interface of Statsboard looks like in the. You could view you could you could think of it like a query explorer view where you could drill down into a specific metric. Um, so there's a couple of things to notice here. So we have the, or there's three main components to this page. One is the graph view, which is this layer on the top. And then the bottom left, we have the actual query that gets made to the uh, data storage layer. And then on the right, we have the T script uh, layer, which is our DSL for uh, interacting with the time series language, mainly as far as like joining, reducing, uh, aggregating uh, different time series together. So a little bit of the history of why we developed a T script. Mm -hmm. uh, we wanted the ability to swap backends, but the user configuration should basically be unchanged. Uh, we used to have nested functions like that's <laughs> graphite um, and users ran into a lot of issues with the levels of nesting and the readability uh, of, of all the nestings. Uh, like users were combining metrics to do um, success rate calculations. That was pretty messy um, with dividing and summing. Um, there was also a lot of repeated uh, summations Right, so if you're if you're summing then in in the numerator and denominator, if you're at depending how they structure the metrics, you'd have to do a sum series twice, which wasn't uh, which was it just made it hard to read. Or if you modified one thing, you had to remember to update all components. Um, so we developed T script to solve th these issues. Uh, so some of the design goals of TScript were that it needs to be database independent. So manipulation of the time series shouldn't depend on the how the database returned the data. Um, it should just, it should work on a common format. We wanted it to be easy to read. Um, so users, if you just were glancing at what TScript was doing, it would be pretty clear there wouldn't be um, a lot of conditionals and other things that would, um, where you would have to keep a lot of control flow in your head to understand it. 
And we also wanted it to be easy, easy to write. So users in general shouldn't have to consult the documentation every time they were trying to do something. It should kind of be intuitive at some level. Um, and as part of those design goals, we wanted to, wanted it to be easy to add context to where help. So we could help users within it, a user interface setting with like autocomplete and documentation pop-ups. Uh, we wanted it to be easy to extend with additional functionality. So knowing that we couldn't possibly um, iterate in all the possible time series uh, methods that users might want, we want it to be easy that users can add their own um, over time. And then we also wanted to use this for alerting. So the, the same way you write alerts is the same way that you manipulate uh, time series metrics uh, just to view them on your graph. It's no, it's no different. So as far as alerting goes, you'll have a time series and it's either zero, which means it's not alerting, or it's non-zero, which, mean which means it is alerting. So that, that resulting time series um, will display on the graph, and that's how we can shade it for whether the alert is in the triggered condition or it's passing. So here's an example of just uh, how users used uh, T script. So this is this is calculating a success rate, like a cash hit success rate or hit rate. Um, so within T script, D the variable D is just the data frame. Uh, so that that's all the time series returned from the query, and then within the square bracket notation, we can select specific um, columns from the data frame and then we could operate on them. So this one picks the hits and then divides it over the hits and the misses and then multiplies by 100. And then this variable hit rate is returned to the graph to visualize. And then the alerting condition is, when, is a new time series that says if the hit rate is below this value of 70, um, and it needs to be below that for five minutes, then that would cause that time series to, to be a one. Um, so the four is a, it's a debounce function. Um, and then we also have, that's crit. We also have warn, which is just, just a different, different level of severity that could have its own notifications. So here's an example of like the autocomplete. So we um, show the parameters that are used to fill in the um, uh, method. So one thing, one thing to point out here is, I think there's some, there is some complication as far as like. <clears throat> How do you deal with empty data? For example, do you show the point? Like if you're combining multiple series and some series don't have data points, like they have, they didn't have a value for that time period, what do you do? Um, so in general, T-Script tries to do what the user would expect. So if you're adding things, you would still, you would show whatever is available. Um, but there, we also provide a way to override that default behavior um, with functions that do similar, so that adds similar to the plus uh, symbol, but users can insert a fill value um, if they if they want. So I think one thing that might be different from, uh, well, for how we do things with time series metrics at Pinterest with T-Script is that T-Script only operates after the data has been returned from the backend. 
So T-Script doesn't really have a concept of what the data uh, storage layer is, how to access the data storage layer. T-Script wants everything to be in a pandas data frame with a very structured format with fixed intervals uh, between time points. Um, however, the backend doesn't really know anything about that. <clears throat> so when we when we get the data from the backend, we use a different interface to query the data. Um, so this this very much comes from OpenTSDB, uh, like the syntax, uh, the aggregations, the ideas of downsampling, um, fill values, uh, tagging. Um, it's pretty much when we built Goku, we wanted it to be kind of pretty much the same as OpenTSDB. So when users did the migration, well, users, users wouldn't really have to migrate anything. <clears throat> we could do it for everyone. And the syntax is basically basically the same. Um, so from so we we've expanded it out in the UI, but the short form is still very much what you would see if you were using OpenTSDB from when we um, developed <laughs> Goku. And I know OpenTSDB has moved on since then, so it's not not quite the same anymore. OpenTSDB has more features now, but um, the idea is the same. So now I'm going to talk a little bit. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the some of the nuances of eScript and some of the problems that we've run into, and then I'll get into the user reception. So as I mentioned, like TScript operates on data frames. Data frames have a fixed interval between um, time uh, timestamps. So we need some way to group the data into these buckets because it's not necessarily the case that the data arrives at the same timestamp. It's not it's not aligned or the intervals that the user wants might not be how the, the interval that the data has been sent. Um, <clears throat> so I think a big a big confusion within T script is like getting getting the data into this fixed interval format um, and then, and what operations have happened on the data to put it into that format. And the thing is like T script kind of, it doesn't really solve that problem because we get the, we, we fix the format before it gets into T script because it, it needs to be into a data frame already at that point. So for us, um, there's a couple of, there's a couple of different ways that we do this, which is also is confusing. So we have a down sample for the graph so that the, the time series within a graph can all be in the same format because for the query interface, you can, you could just add as many time series as you want. You could also use globs and the metric names. So all of those <clears throat> metrics don't necessarily need to be at the same uh, interval. Um, but for the graph, we do put them at the same interval uh, with a, like a graph reducer. So that's one that's one down sample on the left here. On the right, we have the traditional open TSTP down sample. So this is like per time series down sampling. Um, so you have your fill value and your um, interval there. So those those two interact. So it can be kind of, uh, depending on what your data looks like, it could and how many, and if you're joining <clears throat> time series with different down samples, that's where it can get kind of uh, confusing. Um, so that that's one one thing that's a little bit uh, not not really handled by TScript, but handled before that. So how, how overall has the reception of T-Script been? I will say that overall T-Script sentiment is, is fairly positive. 
it's easy to get started with examples. Um, it's easy to explore around in the UI. Um, it generally does what people expect it to, um, such as like adding a series, subtracting, dividing, how it handles uh, empty points, um, how it combines tags. So for example, in, in Graphite, we were having to match tags together um, in a function um, with or with those with the graphite syntax. Uh, but T-Script kind of with the data frames, it'll operate on the, the functions or it'll operate on the tags correctly. So let's say you're looking at, you're comparing a disk usage um, and you have a total and you have a used and you want to get the percent used uh, across um, multiple different hosts. Uh, you, you can do that easily. You don't have to iterate or do anything special. It'll just, it'll match the, the host tag for the total and the used, and then return a new data frame with all the hosts as a percentage uh, or how, however the, the calculation has been structured. But users don't really have to think about how it's joining things to do the aggregations. Um, now that that does that that generally works um, as long as the data is well like structured and there's not a lot of missing data. It gets a little bit confusing um, if there's empty data. Um, how how things start interacting. Another. Another, uh, well, it, another challenge of T-Script is like, we, we do have a lot of functionality in T-Script. So understanding what you can do and how to do it can be hard. Um, often how, how people think about time series data is not, like the mental model that users have isn't necessarily how how it's implemented. So that disconnect there can lead to confusion of like mapping an idea into implementation of a specific T script functionality. Uh, users really like alert, like the alerting capabilities on, on the graph. So there's no, there's no separate alerting uh, view. It's all, it's all dashboards um, and graphs on dashboards. And users really like the two key features of Tscript, which are assigning variables and the multi-line nature of Tscript. So it makes it really easy to use descriptive terms for variables and to um, just, just add lines um, to make everything readable. So if I if I were looking back um, and redesigning T script, um, what would I improve? Uh, so I think one thing is to make it more understandable what's happening with with certain edge cases, such as the calculations with the sparse data. I think that's a constant source of uh, confusion. Um, like if you're, especially like with subtraction or dividing, like often you'll get um, the resulting data frame will have a lot of empty points that might be unexpected for users. Um, I think there's a, there's kind of a, a big disconnect between the query interface and the T-script interface. So often people ask, is there a way to do this in a SQL uh, to query the time series and to um, do, do operations on it. Um, and we, we don't have any SQL-like interface. Another cause of, or something to think about, I, I don't know how to solve these. These are just things that keep coming up repeatedly and it would be good to think about is um, if you have 
data frames and the columns don't match and you try to do operations on them, that's going to result in an error because the dimensions aren't the same. So then users need to explicitly use broadcast. Um, that's kind of an expensive function because um, you're iterating through all the combinations. So users kind of, it, it's it's not necessarily intuitive what's going on and why things can't be joined uh, and what broadcast does uh, to, to handle that. Um, so that's kind of all the prepared slides I have. Um, I would love to go into more details or answer questions um, that anybody has. Thanks. Yeah. Anybody have a question here? Yeah, I have a question. Um, so can you elaborate more on the decision to separate the query from the manipulation language? Uh, and specifically, so if you if your data source is dimensional time series, right? Uh, if you, so like for, for when when you have like manipulation clauses in the language, uh, those clauses certainly imply certain projections of that dimensional time series saying like, oh, I really need only these columns, right? And when you have the query separate, like, cause you said the, the T script operates only on the results after they've downloaded. So you potentially have to download a lot more results than the query itself needs because there's no real communication between the query part and the, and the sort of like a projection part, I guess. <clears throat> yeah, that's that's exactly right. Um, ideally, we would inspect what is happening in the T script and then use that to determine what the query should be. Uh, so the the reasoning behind having the two having it separate is just how the tool evolved over the last decade. Um, that. We used to only have the query, and then we added the additional functionality on top of that. Um, with and we used to have multiple different backends, so it just it was just a natural evolution. Um, but I think I think that does lead to a lot of confusion um, that you have two layers, and then for the user to understand which operations are happening at which layer um, because we have two different ways to do it or two different things they need to be aware of. Um, that's a lot of um, like the mental model is pretty high for the user um, to have the, to understand like how the query operates and then also understand how T script operates. Um, so I, I wouldn't say it necessarily needs to I, I can see it not being required um if we did some work on that piece of it um but that yeah it's just it's just a evolu it's an evolutionary story not necessarily um would not necessarily do it that way um if we were designing it from scratch today mm -hmm. and uh the other question the the examples you had uh, sounds like you are creating on a data frame like structure uh, in the query language. What if you want to uh, query multiple data sources? And let's say you have like a division of two time series, but the sources of those time series are different uh, altogether, one from like one back and another from another. Is that even supported, or how would that be done? Sure. So when we when we used to do that, um, like we used to combine Graphite, Goku, and uh, OpenTSTB uh, queries all together, um, it, it would still, the backend would return um, a, a list of data points um, with maybe uh, attributes or tags on it. So we would take, take that list of data points and then put it into a data frame with columns. Um, so by the time, so that there was a conversion layer that put everything into the common format. So then when it got to the T script to do joins and everything, it, 
it all look the same at that level. Um, but but the querying the querying piece wasn't wasn't unified uh, except for the fact when we converted it to the T script data frames. Hmm. Okay, so the T script still operates in that case on a single kind of table essentially, right? The data frame. Uh, it just somehow joins from multiple data sources the data frame. Uh, yeah, so there there could be multiple data frames uh, present, but e each data source would return its own data frame, and then depending that that's where some of the complications would come in because if the columns aren't the same, doing joins with mismatching columns doesn't work. So mm -hmm. you would have to take like the highest dimensionality column, broadcast those dimensions to the other data frames, and then you can do the operations on it. So it, it, for users, it gets pretty confusing because they don't understand um, if, they, if they just want to add up time series, why things aren't working um, when, when there's a mismatch there. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. If nobody else has a question yet. Um... Is TScript then essentially built on top of Pandas in the library then? Yeah, so all of the, so we, we have our own hmm. parser um, just using PyParsing. It's, it's a pretty straightforward language. You can only do a few things in it, but uh, once, once we have that, so, just walking through the operations, we query the back end that returns a list of points. We take those points and then we turn it. Um, uh, Pandas has functions to turn like lists and things into data frames. So we turn it into a data frame. And then once it's in that data frame, like then we get all the operations that data frames support. So we could apply reductions or aggregations, reduce, reducing things resampling. Um, so those are all pandas functions that are built in um, to that library. But we we have to, we, we just have like the, we do a lot of things within TScript itself to aid the user um, because pandas actually isn't super user friendly, especially for a lot of edge cases. Like yeah. if you're adding columns and there's or if you're adding two time series together and there's NANs, like how do you deal with that? Um, so handling those edge cases, that's, I would say that's a lot of T-script code is like, what do you do in this certain situation? And how do we deal with that? Um, with a goal of like making it super user friendly um, for, for the user, but pretty much none of the operations that we've done uh, within T script itself are like th custom things that we've written. It's just using the, the using the pandas uh, functionality, but making sure everything is formatted correctly and um, exceptions and errors are handled in a reasonable way. Yeah. So you mentioned that for since observability data, a lot of it nowadays. Uh, users want to join it with business data. Um, so that hence the SQL request from a lot of folks. Um, so is your solution kind of to offer up, say, could users who want to join it with BI data um, export, take the T-script, convert it into the data frames, and then use something else like a Jupyter notebook or something to fetch and correlate data with BI using Pandas? That's a great question. So we we have a couple ways of doing that. So one is, yeah, for the Jupyter Notebooks, people can just call the Stats Board API and get the data and then use it directly in the notebook. And then there's other functions to get the business data in that in a, in a different way. Uh, but I think that a big one that I, we've found is we have a... We have a lot of generators, so um, the solution we found is we we take the business data. So we have these SQL queries 
that are crazy, like hundreds of lines. I've never, never seen anything like it, but, but it's, it's insane. But anyway, we, um, users can define these queries and then we execute those queries with a, with a background job. Uh, and then that, that job outputs, um, time series data in the format. It, it was the open TSCB put format. Um, and then that gets ingested into our system as a time series data. So in some, <clears throat> in some ways it's duplicated. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's, it's processed and filtered and somewhat from the SQL query itself, but um, we take that and we input it into the time series database and then we can operate it on it using all the standard functions. Um, so that's, that's kind of the, that's the solution, that's the solution um, that we've come up with. And I, the big driver for that was to have the real time alerting capabilities um, that the stats board provides, which is pretty, it, it's probably the, one of the most powerful features of the tool um, that other things like we use superset um, a lot for the, the visualize uh, business data and that does have some alerting capabilities, but it's uh, more limited. Gotcha. Okay, yeah, that's an interesting route to go then. So do folks kind of tend to um, use the Jupyter notebooks to kind of massage the BI data, join it, and once they figure it out, then craft that query and then port it into the observability system? Or what do users really do for ad hoc if they just want to join? Um, for a quick report, uh, then they yeah they, they can just use the Jupyter notebook directly. Um, there's <clears throat> convenient or convenience libraries that have been ri written over the years um, to get the data into a common format, even from the different data sources. Um, but that's not that's for yeah that's for the exploration use case. Um, but people also use Jupyter for reporting. Um, but I would say that, that one of the, one of the problems that we have is just how we've, how we've implemented T script. It's, it's in Python. Um, you're doing a lot of transformations. And if you have a lot of dimensionality, um, that could get pretty expensive as far as performance. Um, so the, the performance for, especially for longer term data and especially for, a big problem is with like Kubernetes, the pods, and the how the the names change so quickly. Um, that ends up being a lot of data frames. And like one one thing we're looking at now is like how how can we improve the performance? Um, there's a lot of opportunity to use like a more C level type code with uh, NumPy and what which is what Pandas is built on, but um, it's still it's still never going to be as fast as if we could do a lot of the. I didn't mention this in the slides, but uh, T script operates at a high level in Python. If we could do a lot of these operations <clears throat> in the database, especially if we could distribute the work into the leaf nodes, it would be a lot uh, more efficient. Like one common operation is like doing some sort of ranking, like give me the top ten posts that have some sort of metric like sum max doesn't matter but you that's a perfect example of things that can get pushed down pretty far um, to reduce the amount of data returned but if we're if we're getting a, a gigabyte returned from the back end and then we need to decompress it put it into these in-memory data structures um, it's it's pretty intensive um, mainly in CPU time, uh, so I think, um, I, I think that's where like query optimization can really help. <clears throat> so like separating out the query and the T script, like that that's worked just because we've we've been shifting the backend so much. But if we if we could just take the T script and see, oh, we're combining these different data sources. We don't need to do that at the Python level on stack board. That could be done pretty pretty deep into the Goku itself. Um, but at that point, 
that's when you need to have a lot more knowledge of like what's what's happening, what are the resulting data frames in order to tell the time series engine like, hey, join these together. Um, so if we had some like primitive operations that we could push down there, I think it would, it, it, that would be the biggest performance win I could see. Um, and then at that point, I don't know what the query um, would look like, but we kind of need to tie those together a little bit better in order to get the, have the most optimal uh, performance. Anyone else have some questions? Um, I have one more. Uh, we're coming up close to the end, but um, how do you deal with uh, joining, or do you see many requests to join the different telemetry types like logs and traces? You were mentioning you have those in open search. Um, do you kind of follow the same path of setting up a query export as metrics into the time series DB and then join? Or do you have folks asking to say, I want to use T-Script to ad hoc um, query my logs and convert fields into metrics or whatnot, et cetera? <clears throat> yeah, that's a great question. So um, for, for logs and mainly for logs, we take a similar approach where we have a converter that takes the Lucene syntax um, for open search and then turns that into metrics. Um, but that's, I, I haven't seen any requests to um, have a, maybe because we have this converter, it's not really a, an issue. Um, but I, we do have a ton of requests to go from one type of data to another. So like if you're looking at a metric an exception metric, for example, there's a spike in exceptions, like take me to the log search, or the, that's what we call it internally, but the open search query that has that exception. Um, so we've done things to join the data. So we, ha we have common a common key um, that we append as metadata to everything. So when you're on the that graph builder view I shared, there's a little link that says, go to the logs. And you can go directly to the logs that correlate to that um, time frame and that key. So it's not it's not perfect, but it, it works pretty well. That users don't need to think like, okay, what? How do I need to structure this query? Um, so it makes it a little bit easier. And a similar thing for tracing, uh, where we can can pre-populate queries based on. Um, what the metric data has. Um, but there hasn't really been users. Yeah, maybe just because we have the converters, like users aren't really going to um, getting the log search data into uh, the the metric system as is um, without, without that conversion step. Cool. That sounds good. Thank you. All right. Um, so if folks have future questions, um, what's the best way to reach out to you? Oh, yeah. You could just, uh, you could email me at uh, just Brian, B-R-I-A-N, at Pinterest.com. Cool. Great. Well, I really appreciate your taking time to present this to us. And yeah, it's neat to see kind of a different take where there are a lot of languages that are just like PromQL or Kuster or whatnot that are just straightforward, but this is kind of leaning into the data frame and using existing tooling to allow users to do what they want, but simplify it for the observability use case. It's been really fun. Great. Well, thanks a lot, everybody, and we'll get this up on YouTube as soon as we can. Have yeah, and thanks again for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Take, Take care. care.